we continue discussing latent uh, semantic analysis and indexing. So, we saw last time that uh, latent semantic analysis when applied to information retrieval refers to a list of index being built which tries to capture the association between words. And uh, when this word association is used for uh, natural language processing tasks, then we have what is called latent semantic indexing. So, it is better to put down uh, these points. So, latent semantic indexing, this is index of associated terms and uh, latent semantic analysis, this is um, structures of associated terms and uh, this is used for NLP tasks. And here, this index of associated terms is used for better IR. All right. So, in this lecture, we will again look at principal component analysis. Actually, we started it last time. Then, singular value decomposition will be introduced and uh, all this together finally leading to our main topic which is latent semantic indexing or. So, last time what we did was that we did uh, least square method of fitting a line and uh, the example was chosen so that we could go from uh, a space of higher dimension to a lower dimension space. So, uh, given this set of n points which are x 1, x 2, uh, x 1, y 1, x 2, y 2 up to x n, y n. These points are defined by their two attributes x 1 and uh, x and y. And from these we find a line f x equal to m x plus b that best fits the data and m and b are the parameters to be found. So, the line that best fits the data is the one that minimizes the sum of squares of the distances. So, we take the distance of y i uh, from f from f x i, f x i is the uh, value that is returned corresponding to a particular x and the actual value is y. So, y minus f x gives us the distance between the fitted line and the actual value and the square of this distance eliminates any problem with sign and when we sum these square of distances, we have a measure which is a measure of the fitness of the line for this data. So, we have seen that uh, we can partially differentiate these sum square expression with respect to m and b and we get this expression for b which is mean of y minus m into x of y and m itself is found as a kind of covariance. Yes covariance between the y attribute and x attribute okay, divided by uh, something like a variance of x. Okay. So, one interesting question for you to think is why is it asymmetric with respect to x and y? Why is it that m is found in terms of variance of x and not y? Okay. So, x is the controlling variable and uh, that comes as the denominator in the form of a variance. Okay. And this expression also is worth pondering about, because this is mean of the dependent attribute minus the slope of the line into the mean of the independent attribute. So, these expressions are worth uh, reflecting on. and. Uh, have we developing an intuition about what they signify. So, this b and m they uh, minimize the distance square distance between the line and the points and therefore, this line is the best fit according to this point of view. So, there are these points here 1 1 2 2 6 1.5 7 and 3.5 this example is from Manning and Schutz 
the foundation of statistical natural language processing published in 1999 by MIT Press. So, these points uh, are these four points and the points are shown by crosses. Now, we have fitted a line for these points and uh, this is the best line where the slope is 0.25 1 by 4 and 1 is the intercept B on the y axis. Okay. So, this is fine and uh, many uh, prediction problems work with fitting of line, but our interest is different. What we are saying is that now assuming that these two points C and D belong to a particular class and A and B belongs to another class, then we can always draw a line this way, okay, which is the hyperplane in two dimension. This is a line which will separate C and D from A and B. Okay. So, this line can always be found out and the algorithm exists for finding this. But now, suppose we uh, classify these points in a reduced dimension. So, the way to go about this would be for these points A and B, we get the values here, we get the projected values on this line and for C and D, we again get the projected values on this line. Now, you can see that separating the points through their projections is an easier task. So, we can fix a threshold value here okay, and our classifier is simply in terms of this threshold value. It says that whenever the projection value is more than this threshold, then the points belong to one class and when the, this projected value is less than the threshold, they belong to another class. Okay. So, this classification according to us is an easier task than finding a line which separates C and D from A and B. Okay, this is a much simpler task and uh, what is happening is that we have reduced the dimension of the problem. So, the projection of A, B, C and D are now treated in terms of their distance from this special point O and uh, these distances are unidimensional objects okay, obtained from two dimensional representations of the points. And so, we are solving the problem in a reduced dimension. We have come down from a two dimensional problem to a single dimensional problem and this line is helping us do that. So, this is the whole point about dimensionality reduction and uh, we have to uh, take the problem into a different space okay, with different parameters. Fine. So, this point was made last time and it will be worthwhile to remember this uh, point of view. Now, we move on to principal component analysis and we will do it slowly with uh, some examples. So, as was mentioned last time, IDIS data is a very famous data for machine learning algorithms. So, there are 150 data points of this kind. These points are defined in terms of four attributes for flowers. So, petal length, petal width, sepal length and sepal width are the four attributes and the classification is in terms of these three classes, Iris setosa, Iris versicolor and Iris virginica. So, it is a three class problem. Each class has 50 data points, each point defined by four attributes. Okay. So, now the question that we ask is are all these attributes independent of each other, so that all of them are needed or is it that some attributes are highly correlated, maybe petal length is correlated with sepal length okay. and then can we capture this correlation? create a function of petal length and sepal length and instead of four attributes work with three attributes that is the question. Okay. So, then we have reduced the dimension of attributes by creating a new function that is the whole idea. So, principal component analysis will help us here and the training and testing scenario is as follows 80 percent of the data is used for training. So, 40 from each class out of 50 and there are total 120 training examples therefore. 
testing is on remaining 30 examples, they form the 20 percent of the data. So, as has been mentioned already, do we have to consider all the four attributes for classification? Less attributes is likely to increase the generalization performance. Okay. So, multivariate data typically is of this form. We have these p attributes x 1 to x p and there are n rows in this matrix corresponding to n data points. So, this is a an example of multivariate data the structure of this. So, we do some preliminaries maybe with an example. So, suppose we work with this matrix A which has two rows and three columns. So, the values are let us say 1, 2, 3 and 4, 5, 6. So, this is let us say x 1, x 2, y 1, y 2, y 3. So, first thing to do here is par attribute mean. Okay. So, for y 1 we have mu 1 which is the mean of 4 and 1 that is 2.5, mu 2 is the mean of the attribute y 2 this is 3.5 and mu 3 is the attribute of y 3 mean of y 3 this is 4.5 this is the mean. Now, we find out per attribute variance. Okay. So, this mean it must be clear to you is nothing but the attribute values divided by the total number. So, this actually is equal to 1 plus 4 by 2 which is 2.5. Now, per attribute variance. So, for y 1 this is sigma 1 square so, we have to see the departure from the mean. Now, this will be 1 minus 2.5 square plus 4 minus 2.5 square divided by 2 and that is equal to 1.5 square which is 2.25 plus again this is 1.5 square which is 2.25 and this variance comes out to be equal to 2.25. So, you have found out the variance of attribute y 1. Similarly, sigma 2 square will be equal to 2 minus 3.5 square plus 5 minus 3.5 square by 2, this is also coming out to be 2.25 and sigma 3 square is 3 minus 4.5 square. So, variance is coming out to be same everywhere 6 minus 4.5 square by 2 which is equal to 2.25. So, variance is same everywhere. So, now we also find out the sample covariance sample covariance. So, that means we have to find out uh, C 1 2 that means covariance of y 1 and y 2. So, this will be nothing but it will be divided by 2 first of all we have to take the difference from the mean of y 1 multiply it with difference of the value from y 2. So, what I mean is we have to find out the sample covariance between y 1 and y 2. So, take the departure of 1 from the mean take the departure of 2 from the mean multiply by the 2 multiply the 2 here also departure from the mean and multiply. So, departure from mean will be 1 minus 2.5 uh, into 2 minus 3.5, 3.5 
plus 4 minus is it 2 2.5 into 5 minus 3.5. So, this comes out to be equal to minus 1.5 into minus 1.5 plus 1.5 into 1.5 by 2 which comes out to be equal to 0. right? So, this is again 2.25 then we have to find out C 2 3. I think it will come out to be again 2.25, but let us check. C 2 3 is covariance of y 2 and y 3 and this is 2 2 minus 3.5 into 3 minus 4.5 plus 5 minus 3.5 into 6 minus 4.5. Again, it is coming out to be 2.25. So, we can possibly safely also say that C 3 1 also will be 2.25. right? So, C 3 3 1 is also 2.25. Okay. So, going to the slides now. Um, we have uh, looking at the slides, uh, we have the mean as we have th we have found out the mean of each attribute, we have find out we have found out the variance of each attribute, we have found out the sample covariance for pairwise attributes and uh, from these we get this very important co quantity namely the correlation coefficient. So, let us calculate the correlation coefficient for whatever we have done so far, correlation coefficient for our matrix which is this for this matrix. Okay. Now, correlation coefficient R A B is defined as sample covariance divided by sigma A into sigma B. Okay. So, covariance divided by standard deviation of the two attributes. So, now what we have is let us first compute R 1 2 which is correlation coefficient between y 1 and y 2. So, C A B we found to be equal to 2.25 everywhere. Okay, C 1 2 by sigma 1 into sigma 2 and C 1 2 was 2.25, sigma 1 is square root of 2.25, sigma 2 is also same 2.25. So, they are completely correlated. So, this is coming out to be equal to 1. So, R 1 2 is equal to 1. What about R 2 3? R 2 3 equal to C 2 3 by sigma 2 sigma 3. Again, this is coming out to be equal to 1, I believe. And R 3 1 is also equal to 1. So, now going to the slide. So, you have found out the correlation coefficient to be equal to 1 everywhere. Now, for each variable x i j, we replace the values by y i j equal to x i j minus mu i divided by sigma i square. Okay. We found out the correlation coefficient with these values. Actually, what we have to do is that we have to first take the standardized variables and then find out the correlation coefficient anyway. So, now we have got the correlation coefficient and we do uh, principal component analysis using correlation coefficient matrix. So, before that of course, we have to do this eigenvalue and eigenvector computation. Again, we do a bit of basic task. So, for this matrix A, which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, the eigenvalues are computed by this expression A x equal to lambda x. So, going to the slide now, A x equal to lambda x for where A is A represents multivariate data. We have 
x as the column ve vector and this gives rise to the equation a 1 1 x 1 plus a 1 2 x 2 plus a 1 3 x 3 up to a 1 p x p equal to lambda x 1. And this way uh, we set up these equations and find out different values of lambda from the determinant, we will see in a moment. And lambda are called the Eigen values and the solution x 1, x 2 up to x p for each lambda is the Eigen vector. Here is an example. Suppose the A matrix is minus 9, 4 and 7 and minus 6. This is the A matrix. So, first of all we get A minus lambda i, i is the identity matrix. So, lambda i gives us this this matrix lambda 0, 0 lambda. So, A minus lambda i will be minus 9 minus lambda here, 4 minus 0, 7 minus 0, minus 6 minus lambda. So, this will be the A, A minus lambda i matrix. Now, we have to form what is called the characteristic equation. So, that means the determinant equal to 0, we have to form that equation. So, minus 9 minus lambda into minus 6 minus lambda minus 7 into 4 28. Okay. So, this is equal to 0. Now, this left hand side is the determinant equal to 0 is the characteristic equation. When we solve then we find that lambda is equal to minus 13 or minus 2. So, this is a quadratic equation in lambda minus 13 minus 2. Now, when we put this value here that minus 9, 4, 7, 6 into x equal to minus 13 x okay, and solve for x. Let us do it once. So, we have minus 9, minus 4, 7, minus 6 is the matrix into x 1, x 2 is equal to lambda which is minus 13 x 1 x 2. Then we have minus 9 x 1 minus 4 x 2 equal to minus 13 x 1. We are solving for a x equal to lambda x or minus 9 4 okay. Okay, plus 4 right is equal to minus 13 x 1 or 6 x 1 plus 4 x 2 equal to 0 that is 1 and 7 x 1 minus 6 x 2 is equal to minus 13 x 2 or 7 x 1 plus 7 x 2 equal to 0. So, then so one solution is that x 1 and x 2 are all zeros. x 1 and x 2 is a 0 vector, but the other solution is that you can have x 1 as minus 1, x 2 as plus 1. Ah, yes, yes, right 4 x 1. 4 x 1 plus x 2 equal to 0 and this is 7 x 1 plus x 2 equal to 0. So, non zero solution for x 1 x 2, non zero solution for x with lambda equal to minus 13 is minus 1 plus 1. Similarly, for lambda equal to minus 2, non zero x is 4 comma 7. So, this is the way this is calculated. So, we when you come to the slides, we find that for this A matrix the Eigen values are minus 13 minus 2, the corresponding Eigen vectors are minus 1 plus 1, 4 and 7. Okay. So, now we proceed to finding the principal components. Now, from the given matrix we can find out the correlation coefficient matrix. Okay. Just to remind ourselves, how do we find out the correlation coefficient matrix? We convert the given matrix into a matrix of standard variables. So, this is one thing we had missed last time. Okay. So, each value is subtracted from the mean and is divided by the standard deviation. Y i j is equal to x i j minus mu y divided by sigma square. So, this is done. Okay. So, this is done for each value in the matrix. Okay. Then on these standard values, we find out the 
uh, sample covariance and uh, sample covariance is divided by standard deviation sigma n sigma b and we get these correlation coefficients r 1 to r 1 3 etcetera okay, on the standardized matrix. So, take this example of A matrix. So, matrix A which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 is first converted to A standard which is nothing but 1 minus 2.5 divided by, you have to divide it by sigma square. So, 2.25. Okay. Similarly, 4 minus 2.5 divided by 2.25. 2 minus 3.5 divided by 2.25, 5 minus 3.5 divided by 2.25, 3 minus 4.5 divided by 2.25, 6 minus 4.5 divided by 2.25. So, this is known as standardizing the variables in the matrix and this will come out to be equal to this is minus 1 by 1 1.5, this is also minus 1 by 1 1.5, this is also minus 1 by 1 1.5, this is 1 by 1 1.5, this is 1 by 1 1.5, this is 1 by 1 1.5. Okay, so, then A standard matrix comes out to be equal to minus 1.5, 1 by 1.5, 1, 1, 1, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1. This is the matrix we get. From this, we have to find out the R A B values. This is column number 1, column number 2, column number 3. And from this, we will have to find out R 1 2, R 2 3, R 3 1. So, we are not going through that computation now, but it is possible to get this value. And from this, we will get the correlation coefficient matrix, which is equal to 1, R 1 2, R 1 3, then R 2 1, R 2 3, R 3 1, R 3 2 1. So, whatever be the matrix, whether it is square or rectangular, it has been converted to a square matrix okay, and therefore, principal component analysis can be done on this. So, the next step will be for this correlation coefficient uh, matrix R, we get the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Now, we have taken an example here. So, so far is everything clear? Uh, we take the matrix A just look at the just look at whatever we wrote here we take the matrix a first compute the column mean compute the column mean everywhere compute the variance for each column standardize the variables so take the variable value subtract the mean from it divide by variance everywhere okay and that gives us the standardized a matrix from standardized a matrix we get the correlation coefficients for each column okay. and from this we form what is called the correlation coefficient matrix. Okay. Everything is done on the standardized variable mean and variance yes that is right. Okay. So, this is done. Now, here we take an example. Suppose, there are 49 birds and 21 survived in a storm and 28 died. 5 body characteristics are given which are x 1 the body length, x 2 the alar extent, x 3 the beak and head length, x 4 the humerus length, x 5 the keel length. So, some of these are biological terms. So, there are these 5 parameters which represents each part. So, we have a 49 row by 5 column matrix describing the population of birds. Now, the task is to predict the fate of the bird from the body characteristics. So, will the bird survive hmm? with a, a bird with a particular characteristic, will the bird survive in the storm and this classification is done based on the body character. We try to learn the curve. So, we have a 49 by 5 uh, multivariate data 
we process the data through standardization, compute the correlation coefficient. So, for these data we have not shown uh, the actual matrix, but what is of interest to us is the correlation coefficient. So, for these data we have found out the correlation coefficient and this is shown in terms of a lower triangular matrix, because this is a symmetric matrix the values here will be same as the values on this side. So, uh, let us read one column which will be same as the first row. So, the correlation coefficient of first attribute x 1 with itself is 1. Okay. The correlation coefficient between x 1 and x 2 is 0.735, that between x 1 and x 3 is 0 0.662, between x 1 and x 4 is 0 0.645, between x 1 and x 5 it is 0 0.605. So, similarly other correlation coefficients are given. So, now from this correlation coefficient uh, matrix, we can find its eigenvalues and eigenvectors okay, by setting up A x equal to lambda x. Now, these eigenvalues and eigenvectors computation is also not shown, but a method has been already described a few minutes back. So, here we find that the eigenvalues, there will be 5 eigenvalues are 3.612. 0 0.532, 0 0.386, 0 0.302 and 0 0.165. These are the 5 eigenvalues. The first eigenvector V 1 is 0 0.452, then the first component is this 0 0.452, then minus 0 0.051, 0 0.691, minus 4, 0 0.420, minus 3.64. This is the first eigenvector. Okay. Then this is the second eigenvector there is no correspondence between this and this. These are 5 eigenvalues and corresponding to each the eigenvector is shown. Okay. So, maybe this column being placed here is a bit misleading. So, these are the 5 eigenvectors. Okay. Now, what the point is what do we do with this data? We have already mentioned last time that the whole idea of dimensionality reduction is that we have attributes a 1, a 2 up to a n which when passed through a box gives rise to B 1, B 2 up to B m and m less than n. Now, what happens in this transformation is of interest. Okay. Now, from we have converted the A matrix into the correlation coefficient matrix, we have computed the eigenvectors and eigenvalues. So, that is there in this box. Now, what do we do with this is the question. Now, without going into lot of theories of eigenvalues and eigenvectors, we do say that the total variance in the data is measured by the sum of the eigenvalues. Okay. The total variance in the data is measured by sum of the eigenvalues. We can dis discuss this point little later. So, this is equal to the sum of the diagonals of the correlation coefficient matrix and this sum of lambda values eigenvalues comes out to be equal to 5. Now, first eigenvalue is 3.616 that is 72 percent of 5 and this captures 72 percent of the total variance. The second eigenvalue captures 10.6 percent of the variation, third captures 7.7 percent, fourth 6 percent and fifth 3.3 percent. So, first principal component is the most important and sufficient for studying the classification. So, here some amount of insight into machine learning comes into picture. So, after all our learning depends on how representative the data is for the concept. Okay. So, here we are talking about let us say birds which can survive the storm and birds which cannot. Okay. So, as many variations of birds which survive and which do not survive we see the better is the exposure of the learning algorithm. Okay. So, the learning algorithm is better exposed to the situation and therefore, its rich experience should enable it to learn better. Okay. So, now the eigenvalues, we will discuss this theory more in more detail and with more intuition that these eigenvalues capture the variation in the data. Okay. 
and the first eigenvalue which is shown here 3.612 and rest of them you can see are minuscule compared to this value. Okay. They sum up to 1. So, the sum of lambda values computed from the correlation coefficient matrix on standard matrix values always comes out to be equal to the dimension of the correlation coefficient matrix. Okay. So, sum of the eigenvalues is equal to dimension of the correlation coefficient matrix. Now, this particular eigenvalue captures 72 percent of the variation. How it is a variation we will see later. So, now we perform an operation. The first component of each eigenvector is taken. This is 0 0.452, 0 0.462, 0 0.451, 0 0.471 and 0 0.398. Okay. So, what are x 1, x 2, x 3, x 4 and x 5? Okay. These are the five characteristic values. Okay. So, x 1 if I take one particular bar, let us say I take the first bar, then x 1 is its x 1 is its body length. So, x 1 is body length, x 2 is LR extent, x 3 is beak and head length, x 4 is humerus length, x 5 is kill length. There are five different characteristics okay? and these have five different values. Now, they are multiplied by the first component of the eigenvectors, the first component of the eigenvectors and then we obtain the value z 1. Then these x 1, x 2, x 3, x 4 and x 5 are multiplied by the second components of the eigenvector and we obtain z 2. So, for all the 49 birds find the first two principal components. So, these are called the principal components and this becomes the new data and we classify using. So, if I take this example now. The, for the first bird, x1 is 156, x2 is 245, x3 is 31.6, x4 is 18.5, x5 is 20.5. Now, after standardizing, again we have to do standardizing, we get these values y1, y2 up to y, y5. So, the principal component 1 for the first bird will be 0.45 into minus 0.54, the standardized first attribute value plus 0.46, which is the first component of the second eigenvector into standardized second attribute value. So, each attribute value is multiplied by the first component of the eigenvector and this gives me z 1. Similarly, z 2 comes this way. So, now instead of a 49 by 5 matrix, we have a 49 by 2 matrix. Okay. So, there are 49 data points, yes. Each data point instead of being represented by 5 attributes are represented by 2 attributes and these attributes are functions of the previous attributes x 1, x 2 up to x 5. Z 1 is a function of x 1, x 2 up to x 5. The function is obtained from the eigen, first components of the eigenvector and now we have a reduced dimension data and we classify based on that. So, we will discuss this in more detail tomorrow.